Welcome to week six of CIS 204 Unix Shell Scripting and Utilities, and you get to put up with me once again. Today we're going to talk about Interactive Bash. So what the heck is Interactive Bash? Well, anytime you're on the command line, you're interacting with Bash. And, of course, we've got to define Bash. B-A-S-H, the born-again shell. The original shell, uh, the born shell, uh, was available in the 70s and after the C shell and the K shell were developed uh, the bash shell was developed in the late 80s and the bash shell is the shell that's used primarily in Linux and we'll discuss that in, in more detail here in a bit but let's get rid of this cheesy view of me and jump right into uh, today's lecture again it'll be in three parts about 20 minutes each and as soon as I can get this timer going, oh man, we'll get started. Okay, interactive bash. First, but first, there's always something odd. Uh, we talked about grep uh, recently, and I wanted to bring up something called recursive grep, rgrep, or grep space dash capital R. It's a Linux utility, but the fun thing is it searches recursively through a directory structure for all files that contain a regular expression. So if you wanted to find, for instance, you had um, a directory that had thousands of files of customer orders and you wanted to find every time the SKU 1572 shows up, you would type a grep space dash capital R space whatever that number was, 15272 space, and then point it to the directory name that has all of those individual order files in it. So it will search recursively through every one of the files in that directory structure, however deep that directory structure is. There may be 15 layers of directory, subdirectories in that one directory, but it will search through all of them looking for any occurrence of that regular expression. And so it uses the standard grep meta character sets, so that's kind of normal but the fact that it goes through every individual file inside that directory structure to find uh, the uh, regular expression is kind of neat. This is a cheap version of the command that I am showing you and I'm going to use it in the ATS CIS uh, machine. So I just copied that over, I'm going to paste it in. So what does the command do? Well, it's the globally search for regular expression in print, space, dash, recursively space, and I'm looking for the item inside the single quotes, hbecker3. And I'm going to look for hbecker3 inside the slash etc or etsy file in ats-cis. Now, because there are things in etsy that I don't have permission to look at, uh, and I will get errors, I am going to throw all the errors into the bit bucket. So I've said send standard error, STD ERR, which is two, to dev null. Here it goes. Notice it uh, went through, found that I was a member of Etsy group, that uh, I have my own Etsy group. I'm a member of 1009. I'm also a member of 1002. I show up twice in uh, the password. Well, it says I show up twice in the password file. And there I am again in the group file. So that's what the recursive version of grep looks like. And that's good stuff. That can, that can be handy. OK. Uh, before we go any further, I want to do a quick review of uh, last week. So what's the difference between compiled and scripted? Well, a comp compiled code is code that's, you know, C, C++, C Sharp, something that has been written, then is compiled, and it becomes machine language. It becomes assembly. 
basically. At that point, it is in a native format that the machine can take in and manipulate registers in the CPU and send stuff to memory and pull stuff out of memory, uh, do I.O. work. The compiled code is really good for things that have to be done on a regular basis and have to be done quickly. I mean, it quickly in the sense that they have to, they have, to have good performance. Scripted languages, on the other hand, are really good for one-offs, uh, really good for uh, things that don't take a lot of time to do regardless. They, uh, compiling them won't make them that much faster, or writing them in code and compiling the code won't make them that much faster. Uh, it, it's also good because they're easy to read. So the shell script offers some s simplicity. It also offers a little portability and ease of development. To make the shell script work, you use the shebang, which is the uh, pound uh, ball bat, to declare what flavor of uh, shell that you want the script to run under, and most of the time we'll run bin bash. And you should also keep the line under 64 characters in length. But the fun thing is, is with bash, you can specify options to how you want to invoke the bash shell and uh, we won't worry about those now but portability depends on how closely your script conforms to POSIX standards the closer it is to POSIX standards the greater the likelihood that it will run on somebody's odd duck Linux distro so just keep that in mind the the more use and the less you know about who is using it and what distribution of Linux are using keep the thing as close to POSIX as you can so the pieces of shells you can have variables IO redirection the printf and echo to send output to the screen uh, history of shells of course the born shell is the SH it was Elgol based it was built in 77 C shelf it came from Berkeley uh, it's based on the C language in 78 K shell came from Bell Labs and a mix of shell and, and it, it's a mix of shell and C shells written by a gentleman by the name of David Korn. And the Tenix C shell, uh, based on C shell, both K shell and Tenix C shell came in 83. Bash, the born again shell, its later versions uh, offer POSIX compliance, the later versions being versions 2.0 and on, came about in 1989. So the shebang line is pound ball bat, and the shell, in our case, in for everything we do, will be slash bin slash bash. Yes, you can put slash bin slash sh, but get used to using bin bash. Comment lines begin with a pound sign. You can use wildcards. There's the file name expansion, uh, the typical meta characters. Standard I.O. redirection and the pipe symbol are available. Uh, you display output with echo or print or printf. Um, print is okay. Uh, you need to get you need to rely on echo and printf though. Um, I wouldn't use print on a regular basis. Local variables you set with the equal sign. Global variables you use export to make them global. And I, I'm showing path equal bin, user bin, and uh, exporting path. But in reality, the way you would want to do that, the cheap way to do it, is export space path equal bin and user bin for you know. And that's just a, that's just to show you something here. Let me do this. Let's echo dollar $path and see what it is in uh, ATSCIS. So you can see all these odd duck things are in, in here. If I echo dollar $path in uh, my machine, it will be a little less complicated, I believe. So what happens if I just echo path? What does that dollar sign do in front of that echo space path? Well, the dollar sign says, get me the contents of the variable path. I want to see what path is equal. If I echo path, all it's going to do is echo the word path. And it doesn't make any difference which Linux distribution you go to. If you echo space path, 
you won't get the contents of the path variable you'll just get path okay well that was fun so let's move on reading user input uh, you can use the uh, the built-in command read you can pass arguments uh, to a script from the command line you can use arrays using the declare space dash a you can do command substitution and I want to show you this I'm not going to show it to you inside a shell I'm actually going to show it to you um, using uh, the command line now up equal and this funny uh, tilted uh, single quote now equal date if I echo dollar now what do I get I get the date because that's what that the contents of that variable are now the command date if I do this echo today is space dollar parentheses now close parentheses double quotes look at what well why did it do that again your mileage may vary you always want to test that before you you use it so in my case if I get rid of these uh, parentheses I get it okay again your mileage may vary always test before you deploy a script okay well let's clean this mess up get out of this throw that over there and pull up this okay arithmetic it can be done in the shell it's a pain in the rear end and it's not very good so you really want to use other tools to uh, do any uh, math uh, yeah you can do simple arithmetic inside the shell using the declare space dash i or the typeset space dash i set the variable name and then equal to whatever you want it to work with you've got the typical operators for equality uh, logical operators the and or or not the relational operators greater than greater than equal to and the rest there are conditional statements you can use inside of shells if else in case also loops can be done the while loop you can declare functions with the function name and you can also test files to see if they're either a directory uh, if they're readable writable executable and whether or not they have a size greater than zero there's also a little command insertion you can do. You can uh, throw uh, information inside um, the actually whatever you want to do. Okay, Let, we're done with week five. Now I want to give you a little word about POSIX. Uh, why is why are standards good? What you see in front of you is uh, the uh, cockpit of a model T Ford this was uh, this car came about before there were any set standards for control layout and why is it important to understand well would you believe this pedal over here is not the gas pedal that is the brake pedal the pedal in the middle is not the brake pedal it's the pedal for the reverse gear this pedal over here says it's a clutch pedal but it's really not the clutch pedal it's the low gear neutral and high gear pedal the clutch is actually sitting on this lever now what happened to the gas pedal there is no gas pedal it's this little uh, arm that's sitting on the side of the steering column uh -huh. okay now every now and then you need to advance the ignition timing as the car warms up you need to advance the ignition timing there's an advance lever over here that's all done automatically these days so why am I comparing a Model T Ford to uh, software because the POSIX standards allows you to go from one car one manufacturer's car in this case Linux distribution to another manufacturers Linux distribution to another manufacturers Linux distribution without having to relearn how to operate it 
you could go from one car to another at the beginning of uh, the automobile era and have to completely relearn how to use it because everything would be different. So POSIX standards are really good. They're uh, to our benefit and it is to your benefit to conform to the POSIX standards as closely as you can. Again, especially if you don't know what distribution your shell is going to be run on. Okay, versions of Bash. So again, Bash is the born again shell. And with anything in Linux, if it looks like it's a pun, it is a pun. Um, release 2.x of Bash included C shell and K shell features. And it is POSIX compliant. It's also freely available. It's open source and subsequently nearly universally available. It is the standard shell across the globe. Puerto Rico, I've been in, they use Bash. Sweden, they use Bash. Germany, they use Bash. England, they use Bash. Thailand, they use Bash. India, they use Bash. Everywhere I've been where there's been Linux environments, the users of Linux use Bash. So it's there. It's standard. So let's take a quick peek here and find out which Bash we're using. I'm going to use the Bash dash dash version command and if I have an option on a command that has a dash dash in front of it that is a POSIX option so here's what I get in ATS CIS I'm using a 4.2.45 release uh, GNU bash and what does GNU stand for? It's GNU's not Unix it refers to itself in the acronym. So this is, as you can see, a Red Hat distributed version of Bash. So free software, you're free to change and redistribute it. There is no warranty to the extent permitted by law. OK, so that's on the ATS CIS uh, jccc.edu, which is a CentOS image. So, which version of Bash am I using on Ubuntu? Well, it's a little bit newer version. It's 4.3.42, and it's also a PC version. It did not come from uh, Red Hat. So, again, this was from the GNU uh, distribution. It is uh, freely available, and it is open source software. And if you want to see the license, there it is. Uh, free software, you're free to change and redistribute it. Again, no warranty to the extent permitted by law. Okay, let's move forward. We've talked about the startup sequence before. First, there's the init, the PID1 or systemd, which reads startup files and scripts in the operating system. It, it actually looks for those in the RC 0.d uh, or the 2.d or whatever it, whatever state you're in, and initiates processes to read standard input. Okay, so on some implementations, the program is Getty, or it's PTY, pseudo teletype, and PTS on some others. So if I do this, let me clean up here. Let me grep. Um, Hugo, uh, let me grep. What do I want to do? Oh man! Now I'm going to come back to this. So when a user attempts to log in through a port, the login process takes over, and it encrypts and verifies the user's password. So when you when it asks for, for your password, it will encrypt it. Brought and send it back across the uh, teletype, uh, the pseudo terminal, and uh, authenticate you. Then there's a number of command files that are opened and are run to configure your environment. So, command files, what do you mean? Well, there's a, a number of hidden files that uh, are activated that are set, and those start up your environment. They set your path. They do a number of things. Um, so if I go back here and look at the various uh, processes that are running, you notice that this is uh, 
here I have the bash shell. So if I do this, if I do a PS-EF, and this is where I wanted to go previously, grep for Hugo, and this is going to give me tons of junk, um, but let me do this. Let me grep for bash. Okay, here we go. So here's uh, 452, and 452 again, that's the bash shell that I'm running, and we go from there. But if I wanted to, I could work this way all the way back down to uh, PID1, and we don't need to do that right now, but uh, just for curiosity, LightDM is the display manager in Ubuntu. So let's uh, pause right now. We'll stop uh, the first part of this session. We'll pick it up with the next piece, which is environment variables, those odds and ends that I said were going to be set in the background. So we'll see you in uh, just a few minutes.